Hi, Julie here. One of the things I'm on a quest for most right now is to bring my coaching skills, 13 years of motherhood, and all the lessons I'm learning on the podcast to you. If you're like I was a year ago, on the verge of something new and big in your life, and you don't want to move through it alone, I'd love to talk with you about how coaching with me could help you get clear and connected as you move into this next chapter of your life. I'm offering free 30-minute discovery calls to hear what you're on a quest for and share how I can help. If you're feeling ready to say yes to yourself and more fully living your epic life, visit mothersquest.com to schedule a time. Now, on to the show. Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high-energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? In the months leading up to a big milestone birthday, I decided it was time to stop sidelining my dreams and realize that I'm the hero of my own journey. I knew I didn't want to do it alone, so I created this podcast to learn from other moms on their own quest, so their words of wisdom and lessons learned could help light the way for mine. I created this podcast for myself. Come along with me, and you'll find some treasures of your own. Hello, and welcome to episode number 25 of the Mother's Quest podcast with a podcasting leader, mentor, and community builder extraordinaire, the insightful and passionate Elsie Escobar, a podcaster herself since 2006. At the time of this recording, Elsie's getting ready to be inducted into the Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame at the upcoming Podcast Movement Conference. Among many accomplishments, she's being recognized for her two impactful shows about podcasting, The Feed, the official Lipson podcast, and She Podcasts, the podcast for women about podcasting, and new media from the woman's point of view. Elsie has a lot to say about podcasting. She's a self-proclaimed diehard podcast junkie who especially loves to help women like myself find clarity and power in our voice and shift the narrative to focus on the things that matter most. Not the numbers or downloads, but the transformative power of podcasting and expanding our podcasting audience. Elsie and her She Podcast partner, Jessica Kupferman, have developed together an incredible Facebook group with thousands of members, many of us mothers, on a quest to bring our mission forward through podcasting, while showing up fully for our children in the magic and also the struggle and mess of motherhood. Pursuing podcasting and motherhood herself is Elsie She podcast partner, Jessica, who wanted to dedicate this week's episode to Elsie herself. Here's Jessica with the dedication. Thank you so much for the opportunity to dedicate this episode of your podcast. The star of the hour, Elsie Escobar, is one of the most amazing mothers I know. And of course, I haven't listened to your interview of her yet, but Elsie has a special gift that both is a curse and a blessing when it comes to being a mother. Elsie is extremely empathetic. And by that, I mean, I think that she both can feel and pick up feelings from those that are closest to her. So what I've seen from her as I've gotten to know her and become close to her in the last few years is that when her children are upset and also when they're gleeful, Elsie is also both equally as upset and gleeful as they are. It's as if she is a mirror for other people's feelings, whether she likes it or not. And especially when it comes to motherhood, she is also one of the few mothers I know that has not just dedicated their lives to making sure that their children have the best care and the best food and the best environment to play in, but that also that their impact on the earth as a family is the best that it can possibly be as well. She is someone who has gone through a lot with me over the last three years with my own children. 
I know at times it's been really difficult and maybe even strained our friendship a bit because the pain and suffering that I've been going through with my daughter as she's been mentally ill and suffering through addiction, I think has probably taken its toll on Elsie's emotions. But she has never let that interfere with her support of me. She has always been the best friend. She has always given me the best advice. She has always been a great listener. And she has continued to support me as a mom before anything else through this entire ordeal. What can you say about a friend who suffers through motherhood right along with you every step of the way? Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about Elsie, to talk about our friendship, and to talk about what an amazing, amazing mom she really is. Thank you, Jessica, for those thoughtful and honest words about yourself and about Elsie. This empathic quality of Elsie's you describe comes through in our conversation and the way she talks about making space for her children, for her passion, for dialogue that elevates, and for understanding the needs and behaviors of podcast listeners. In this episode, we cover a lot of territory, from Elsie's roots in El Salvador and how she saw her mother reinvent herself after they emigrated to the U.S., to the power and potential of podcasting to reach the ears of those who are underrepresented and need it most. It was such an honor to have this time with Elsie, to experience her fire and passion firsthand, and hear her call to amplify women's voices change the conversation to the things that really matter, and bring the transformative power of podcasting into our communities. Elsie gave me a personal challenge, which I did accept, to step outside of my digital comfort zone and go to my local library to find mothers where they are and bring Mother's Quest to them. I'm inspired by Elsie to expand and stretch my voice, my impact, and who I reach and welcome into my community. I hope this conversation will inspire you to do the same. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Elsie, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, sweet lady. Thank you so much for inviting me. (laughs) I like to give a little background for how I, you know, come to bring on different guests. And I want to say about you that when I started on my podcasting journey, we're just even beginning to think about doing a podcast. My dear friend, Amy Miyamoto said, are you on the She Podcast Facebook group? You need to be there. And I joined and in all honesty, I don't think I would have launched this podcast if not for that incredible community that you have cultivated there. So yay! Starting with a huge thank you. And one thing I really appreciate about you and so many of your posts in the group is the way in which you remind all of us to see beyond the numbers. Mother's Quest just passed our 10,000 download mark, and it was a milestone. And I had your voice in my head, though. (laughs) (laughs) What are all the other indicators that I want to pay attention to right now that have nothing to do with numbers that are telling me that this is making a difference. So I'm looking forward to, as we dive into this conversation, for you to share more about your perspective on all of this, which is really- Oh my gosh. Yes. No, I'm so excited. You know, it's (laughs) one of the things that I have been teaching in my mentorship program is, you know, I didn't really start this as a necessarily like something that had principles and things like that within mentoring women, you know, but as I started to have conversations independently, right, and I was like diving into everybody's stuff and making sure I was just providing individual specific, you know, conversations and dialogue for that person. All of a sudden, I found myself saying the same things over and over again. And I was like, okay, so this is important because it just kept coming up, right? And one of the things is the concept of language that you can repeat. And this came from a conversation. Actually, it wasn't even a conversation. It was an article that I saw from a quote from DeRay McKeeson. And he is a Black Lives Matter activist. And he had this powerful quote that 
was around the concept. Essentially, what he said is that in most forms of media, including podcasting, most of us are being told the way the world is. And what I gathered from that is that we're not necessarily in dialogue. It's like we get behind the mic. Here we are in a podcast. Here we go. Here are the words for you. This is the thing that we're doing in the world. And then our listeners are sort of left with, yeah, but we don't really teach them how to take that message and share it in a way that resonates with them so that we really teach language that you can repeat. You really are clear about what that message is. And part of my message, like this kind of conversation that when you're telling me like you had me in your head when you were saying I had these amount of downloads and that was amazing and I'm so proud, but you still had that little bit of going like, how else can I quantify this? Right. That's language that you can repeat. Mm. That's what matters for us as podcasters. So whatever that is for those people that are on their quest, on their mother's quest, right? When they listen to you, what's the little voice that they're going to have in their head from you? And what can you, Julie, do to make sure that the language that you give them is exactly what you want it to be? so that they can clearly convey the message of Mother's Quest out there beyond being told that this is the worry the world is. Yes. I love how, as I have these conversations, I feel like the themes just keep building on each other. So in the episode that I just released last week with Elizabeth Cronus McLaughlin on yes. intersectionality and the age of the new heroine, one of the things she talked about is consciously cultivating our communities. Mm -hmm. like as you just said that, I'm now thinking, how am I consciously cultivating the messages that I yep. share in this space? Absolutely. Maybe. It's so powerful because there's something amazing when your listener can turn around and teach your concepts or share your concepts with another person that's coming from them versus Julie said this and this and this, but that they can turn around and that they can convey that impact, that mission that you've put into the world so that it no longer becomes what you've come up with, which is amazing, right? Because it's great. And we do need to sort of honor our teachers every time we do this. But part of it is that they are then able to take it and get the ball rolling from it. And that's really where that transition happens. I remember I first started to teach yoga. You know, one of our teachers would say, just go ahead and copy, copy what we say, like just literally, like write it down. This is the way you teach, you know, downward facing dog. You press your hands down, lift your armpits up, you know, things like that. Say those words. Do not try to reinvent the wheel here. We need to get really focused. And so we would just start saying it. Press your hands down, lift your armpits up and all this stuff over and over again. And there came a point when those words no longer were their words. They were ours. And that's when the teacher comes into play. That's when you do become that leader is when that synergistic depth or distillation into your truth really happens. Mm. Yeah. That, that's language that you can repeat. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. And I feel like it's simmering. This whole concept is I'm taking it in and integrating it. And that's exactly what you're talking about doing, how we can kind of filter it through our own experience and make meaning of it. Yeah. I want to move into hearing more from you about your life and your quest. So I start every podcast episode with this question about how did you grow up and wanting to hear about the impact that your own mother had in shaping who you are today. And I'm hoping that you can also then connect that to what you do today and what you feel like your life's mission is that you're on a quest on. So your childhood and your relationship with your mom and how that has shaped who you are and what you're doing today. I was raised in El Salvador. That's where I was born. And so that's my childhood till I was about nine years old. That's where I was at that time. And my mom was very young. She is a very young mom. She had me about 22 years old. So I think that, you know, I have just memories of us being together, but also at the same time, you know, the culture over there is not necessarily everybody's together, sort of like the way we are, at least most of us now. There's a little more cohesiveness to parents and kids where Everybody is kind of more together most of the time. 
versus when I was growing up, there was a very, very big separation. Like adults do this, kids do that. It was always separation. It was always like, you know, the parents do here. If you go to a party, this is where the parents talk. This is what the parents eat. They have these crazy, amazing hors d'oeuvres. And then we get like chips and soda over here. The kids are over there. It didn't feel like everything was together most of the time. And whenever I was at the house, I was essentially kind of by myself. And I'm incredibly shy because I felt like one-on-one, I'm really good. But with groups of people, I just don't really necessarily dig it too much. You know, when I was in El Salvador, that was my experience. It was very much adults are there, kids are here. You are essentially quiet. You do not speak. You follow the rules. The end. Then we moved to the United States. It was a huge immigration, of course. Changed our entire family. Five of us pick up with five suitcases and moved to this country and left everything. My mom had always been essentially taken care of. Like my grandmother made her all her clothes. My grandmother told her what to wear. She never had to do any cooking or cleaning. In El Salvador, the middle class also has maids. So that was part of the system. So everybody cooked and cleaned for her. And then in her early 30s, I would assume, or maybe late 20s, we moved to the United States. And she had then to do everything. She had to dress herself, buy her own clothes, dress her children, clean the house, make food, like all of the things she had not done until she was in her early 30s, ever. She had a crash course in a different country with no language. So, I mean, to watch her thrive in that environment, to watch her take it on and be then in it. Not to say that she wasn't in it and she wasn't my mom before, but there was, like like I said, there was that separation. Parents were like sort of like way up in their thrones in a way, Mm -hmm. I guess, too. And then this time she was here with us. We were together all the time. She walked us to school. You know, she was constantly at school in this new place. She immediately started volunteering at the elementary school. She sort of became embedded in all of the choices that we made. Very present all the time. She didn't work. She stayed at home and she was supportive of us the whole time. You know, that was like, essentially, I'm thankful for her for stepping up that way. She was like, I mean, now that I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know how she did that. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Because I know how much I'm struggling. I've been here. You know what I mean? (laughs) I've seen it. Struggling with doing all the things. Yeah, struggling with doing all the things. And I mean, you know, we didn't have very much money. I mean, I remember one of the first Christmases we had here, we had not enough money to buy any presents or a tree or, you know, and I remember making ornaments like she got that this dough recipe where we cooked the ornaments and painted them. And that was like what we had for our ornaments on the tree, like everything that was on the tree we made. And it was kind of fun because we've never done that before. Because again, in El Salvador, everything was sort of separate, right? So there was this separation experience. And then when we came here, it was like family. We are together. We are all together forever. Us. Here. You know? And so that was really pretty admirable to see her step up in this way. And for me not to even know this. It was until later that she would start to reveal bits and pieces about what I just told you. Like, And I would have never known that because I didn't know. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. You didn't realize she was reinventing herself. Yeah, not at all. It was just like par for the course. Like I never saw her waver. I never saw her. And so what do you think the impact of knowing all of that now is on who you are today and on your mission and your path? We're survivors. We kind of do what we do. We survive. And it's a double-edged sword, but I think that's, I feel the path of an immigrant, you know, whenever we come into a new country, there is a gift that we have sometimes to acclimate ourselves to any situation and to be able to provide or thrive no matter what, whether you have a tiny little, you know, one bedroom apartment where you have to house all of these people and provide for all of them, have two or three different jobs take care of the babies in all of these different ways and at the same time still thrive, which is like, what? It's amazing. You know, it's like mind blowing because now upon looking back, I think, wow. um, Wow. I mean, we lived in a two bedroom apartment 
I had to share my bedroom with my brothers till I was 13. Ooh. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I can imagine that would be very challenging. Ooh. How many brothers? Two. Okay. Younger. All I'm saying is that was tough. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't really even have my own space till I was 14. Oh, I never had my own room. The thing I'm finding so interesting listening to this though, is that, you know, so from your description, your mother had a lot more you know, luxuries. Yes, yes. Yet, the description, certainly of your connection with her, and even the richness of her life and her own sense of empowerment, it really does sound like it wasn't until she came here and took away a lot of those other things that she really was thriving. Oh, absolutely. Which is the interesting part because I can't really comment on what her experience would have been in El Salvador if she would have stayed there. But I can comment from my experience that I probably would not be who I am now in this way if I would have stayed because yep. society, you know, is much different. And there's a lot more limitations, at least when I was growing up too, around behavior and expectations of what that is as a woman. I mean, we are, you know, there's all this talk. And of course, it's incredibly important, women's voices and, and feminism and a very vocal movement that we have come to hear and continue here in the United States, historically, a little bit here, a little bit more, a little, you know, it's like slowly but surely kind of movement that way. But in El Salvador, that's not like, you know, I can't really truly comment on the historical aspects of it because I didn't really study the history and politics in El Salvador as they pertain to women's rights. But I can say that there is absolutely a difference when I was raised that way. And so there was an expectation, you know, little girls do this, little boys do that. This is how you behave and this is how you don't behave. The end. I want to jump now then into your life today, the woman you have grown into as a result of the model you had in your mother and being able to move here and have the experience that you've talked about immigrating to the United States. I talk a lot about the heroine's journey and this idea of answering our call and really becoming the author of our life story. What would you say is the call you are answering and the focus of your life's story? I think it's all about speaking up. That is a theme that continues to show itself to me, both individually and universally, all in a variety of different ways. And the ability for us to speak up from a really grounded place and take on that conversation, the conversation that matters, and to elevate dialogue. Because a lot of the time, something that I've excelled at fairly well, and I think that this comes from the way that I was raised. It is from society and culture around me. As a woman, to be able to very easily not really talk about the things that matter, but if somebody says something that doesn't necessarily align with my belief system or is absolutely just hideously wrong. I can divert the conversation towards something else or giggle. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the giggle is always or smile and hee hee hee, that kind of stuff that kind of softens conversations and elegantly points them somewhere else, but doesn't really ever address the issue. So I'm pretty good at that. And so my challenge to me is to be able to, in a non-aggressive, like, way, but in that same grounded, elegant way, be able to continue the conversation and elevate it to a place that it deserves. I absolutely experience that from you all the time. You really are mastering that. Oh, you're so kind. Well, let's move into what I call the epic guideposts of our quest. So when I set out to create Mother's Quest and I was trying to figure out what is it that I'm really wanting for myself and for other mothers, this phrase, which became the tagline, live your epic life is what came to me. And it captured this idea of the hero heroine's journey, but also each letter is an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I believe help us to live that life in the years when we're focused on raising our children. And I want to ask them to call out each of these guideposts, and then I want to hear from you the ways in which these guideposts are showing up in your life. All right. All right. You're ready. I'm ready. 
So the first one, E, stands for engaged, and that's about being engaged mindfully with our children. So when you think about being engaged mindfully with your children, what comes to mind? What are the ways in which you do that? Now I've started to create space for us, individual space, whenever, particularly, again, from that place of speaking up, when my little girls are having an issue or they are displeased with a choice that we as a family have agreed to and they start to freak out in their bodies and maybe throw tantrums here and there, then we create space. And what I've done is I just call them. I want them to come into the room with me. And that's what I've been doing here in my in-law's house. I call them and we come into the pink room and we just sit down and quietly, very non-aggressively, like I try to get, I just learned this tip from the Joyful Courage podcast. She was having a conversation with one of the co-authors of The Whole Brain Child. So she has this tip for like whenever your kid is freaking out to get in like a lower gaze, like as much of a submissive space as possible. So I sit on the floor, I kind of hunch my back a little bit and I look up at them. And then we talk that way. And I tried it a couple of times. It really worked with my almost nine-year-old. My little five-year-old, she was a little resistant there for a second, but I felt her energy soften once I did that. So that's how I've been engaging mindfully with them Oof. lately. So interesting. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll make sure to link to that episode so that we can understand more about that. Yeah, it was so awesome. But in general, it's creating the space. Yes, and- creating the space to have the conversation that's not charged. And yeah. the reason I'm doing that is because I need it. Mm-hmm. I do not want to rely on my habitual patterns of being a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> So the the physical cue of making yourself smaller actually is even a reminder for yourself about how you want to show up and make space for them. Yes, totally. So smart. Okay. The next guidepost, P, stands for passionate and purposeful, and that's making a difference beyond your family. What are you most focused on in your work right now? podcasting. (laughs) And actually, you know what? Advocating for podcasting as a tool for transformation, really. Say more about that. The marketing thing beyond the, I'm an expert when I have this podcast, beyond all of that stuff. But to understand that women's voices are here, women's voices are powerful. And we together need to shift the narrative and we absolutely can, but we cannot rely on the externals to do that. Meaning we can't rely by all of the data points that have been put out there already for us, sort of like, and the reason I mentioned stats so much, it's because it feels incredibly masculine to me. Yeah. It feels constraining. It reminds me of getting on the scale and it reminds me of something like of seeing the numbers and then judging yourself based upon the fact that when you stand on that scale, if you're a hundred pounds, great. If you're 105 pounds, oh no, I've gained five pounds. And it's somehow you've diminished yourself, but you're not really thinking about all the other stuff. Like how are you engaging with food? Is your relationship with food shifted? Have you tried new foods differently? You know, is there a different kind of conversation that you're having with your breath now? Are you allowing for more quiet time in your life? Like there's all of these other more important layers. You know, I could be 100 pounds and be the unhealthiest person that ever lived on the planet. But, you know, it just feels like a constraint and I don't like measures, that kind of a measure to quantify our worth. So I'm trying to change that narrative. There has to be something that's more feminine and a lot more fluid to really qualify or quantify that kind of impact that we're having in this space that's not about the current amount that we're putting out there. Yeah. I like to talk about epic snapshot moments Yes, as these moments in our life that you feel like you want to bottle up where you realize this is exactly what I want more of. This is what I'm really aiming for. When you think about your work in podcasting, getting this message out, what's an example of a snapshot moment that comes to you where you realize you really were making this difference in the ways that matter? Oh my gosh. The E-League, which is my mentorship group, these ladies have just blown my mind. I mean, we go deep in a lot of this stuff where we just sit down and we really 
really break things down and really make sure that their voices are being heard and primarily independently because I work very one-on-one with them. But the opportunity to be part of the whole presents itself. It's a very subtle group that I put the component of the group out. It's not a group thing. It is just a part of it. And seeing the ability for them to develop the skills to advocate for themselves and to use language that they can repeat and they continue to always question, what's my impact? There's nothing more empowering, Julie, for me to know that I'm on the right path because they are reaching places that they didn't even think that were possible simply because of a mind shift, their ability to do that. And if I give them those tools and then they take them on themselves, oh my God, it blows my mind. Like It makes me just want to crawl actually into my bed and start crying from joy because I'm like, oh my God, I can leave them and they're going to take over the world. Yes. (laughs) Amazing. Well, I, for me, inside the She Podcast group where a lot of these women are also active members, I have heard them talk about the impact of working with you. And I've also seen you champion them, which is one of your incredible gifts too, that you you bring, you shine a light. On the oh, so thing. good. So the next guidepost I stands for invested in yourself. What are the ways in which you have done that? I think with coaching, you know, coaching has been big for me too, to finding the right business coaches to align with. And when I say business, it's weird because it's so against who I am by nature. I really do not like the phrase entrepreneur. I don't consider myself that. It doesn't resonate with me. Business podcasts are not my thing. Talking about money, talking about business are not my thing. But I have been so lucky to find women who speak my language and Mm. are also bosses. You know, I need like strong presences, the hammer (laughs) in my life. And I have two women that I feel that I can trust fully in that respect. In addition to my co-host, Jessica, who is incredible. So I feel just having her in my life and being able to do She Podcasts is an investment in myself as a human. And also investing in coaching with the right people who completely get me and support me and help me be everything that I can be and call me on my stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is leading us into the last guidepost, C, which stands for connected to a strong support network. And that is really so that we have this feeling of being in community and not isolated on our journey. You started to talk about some of these connections that are your community Say a little bit more, though, about how you cultivate such incredible partnerships and find these people that are so helpful to you. I've been so lucky that, you know, when I was a little girl, one of the things that I had to really face when I was kind of, because I've been always so shy, is that I've really gotten to know myself. So I was with myself a lot. I really knew things that I liked and I knew things that I didn't like. So I've never been peer pressured too much because I seriously am like, uh, no, bye. Mm. Or when it comes to fashion, none of that stuff. I always was like, I like the green one and everybody's wearing blue, you know, and I tend to do that kind of stuff. And so given the fact that I have such strong likes and dislikes, I have a feeling that I've always called to me people who are also like that, who are really, they know themselves very well. And those are the people that I resonate with the most and have the closest friendships with. Women who know who they are and that aren't easily pushed over and also have really strong personalities. Generally speaking, they are the parts of my personality that I lack. So I tend to really fall in with that. So I've been really lucky to do that. And the clearer that I get now verbalizing what I say into the world and voicing my my value voicing, my gift voicing, my mission, then because of the clarity of what I'm putting out there, people then go, oh my God, yeah. And then they just come to me. Then it's great because they get it, which is awesome. So that's where my connected support comes from. But I mean, it took me a while because I didn't really have any kind of support until much later in my life. And even when I became a new mom, I did not ask for help. And I suffered, especially when for the first like year, I was in a very, very dark place emotionally. Not that I wasn't depressed necessarily, but I was getting to a point where I was feeling like a caged animal. 
It wasn't depressed. It was like, if you poke me, I'm going to eat you alive. Wow. And so what helped you get out of that? I have an incredibly evolved, mature partner who essentially- yes, he has a support network. Yes. He is a solid person who came and he literally sat me down and said, you need to find somebody else to talk with. You got to call your friends. You have to get out of the house. You need to do anything that you need to do to take care of yourself. I am not everything for you. You need to figure that out. He said, I will support you with anything and everything that you need to do. All you need to do is ask me because I had made up a story that I had no support in my own head, which was totally not true. He said, you have this, you have this option, you have this option, you have this option and this option. All you have to do is say, hey, I need time. I got to go. Can you please take care of the baby? The end. And I was like, oh. Yeah, what a gift. Yeah. He is perhaps one of my biggest teachers. You know, it's like, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. He won't hold back truths. Sometimes they are very hurtful in the sense that it's hard to hear the truth sometimes. And my ego suffers a lot and I react a lot. But after a while, I kind of see... <laughs> <laughs> I kind of grow up a little bit and go, okay. It's kind of tough for me to speak about this, but there's a level of LC that is put out in the digital space, right? And this goes back all the way to what I was talking about before when I said my mission is about giving voice and being able to address, you know, the issues that arise. So the thing is, I become very skillful at being able to be what needs to be at that moment. Hmm. And so I take things on as in like in the online space, I understand aesthetically what you need to put forward, what words need to be said, how you craft a sales page or how you craft a blog post, how do you create a social media post, how do you create community in the digital space and, you know, branding, visuals, like all of that stuff. I get it. I understand how to create audio so that it's very impactful. I get how to do videos and pictures so that they create the image that needs to be put out there. Yet I lack the skills in being able to make those deeper connections at an intimate level. Because of my gift of being so digitally skilled, I was able to <laughs> call to me a much more evolved man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when he stepped into me, he was expecting what I put out. When we came together and really dove into our relationship, he was in a little bit of a shock that there was still much maturing from me. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. You see? What is the LC that he experiences? He experiences a little bit more wine. He experiences a little bit more of the diva. At times, mm. he experiences a little bit more of emotions that come before logic. And my favorite, which is complete detachment, which for me, it's a very wonderful place to live in, <laughs> where it's like, I'll just listen to this podcast or I seriously tune out. Like I completely tune out from the world. I'm completely disconnected because I'm so in my head. I live mm. in my head. It's my favorite place is my head. And so I hang out in my head a lot. You know, it's patterns, patterns that I built for so long and no one's ever called me out because I'm so skilled at delivering when I need to. Mm. Interesting. You know, cause I'll be like, boom. I'm always like, I can put on a show very well, but that's it. Like if anybody else like keeps coming back to, into the backstage, into the green room, <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> well, I want to shift gears for a moment before we get to the last two things, which is inviting you to give me a challenge and then to close with acknowledgments and reflections. But I just first want to give you an opportunity to say anything else that is important to you. Part of how we ended up having this opportunity is you are about to go to the podcast movement where you're going to be inducted into the hall of fame 
and just have, you know, a lot of incredible opportunities to be the voice for women podcasters. And you said, you know, you reached out in the She Podcast community and said, I'm really wanting to have conversations about the things that matter to me about podcasting. And so, you know, at the end of this conversation now, I want to just give you a chance. Is there anything else you feel like you haven't named or said yet that feels really important for the message you're trying to get out there? Absolutely. I think, well, we kind of touched on it slightly when we were talking about downloads and all that kind of stuff. And I feel that there is a lot of, especially with the experts in the industry or the pundits, if you will, around the podcasting space, those with the bigger money pockets or coming from public media or radio or all that kind of stuff, that there is an infinite amount of conversation around monetization models, advertising, data, how it sucks and that it's so hard to really gauge podcast download stats and all of that kind of stuff and discovery problems and all this and apps being created that are going to be solving these problems. But really, I am so wanting to have this conversation to move towards something different, which are socioeconomics and cognitive behavior and how that really affects the entire industry growth. And what that means is currently, given the podcasting stats that you see out there that are put out by Edison Research, the majority, at least a big, huge part are, you know, people who are earning $100,000 a year or more primarily are male and white. And that is it. And what's happening now is that people, or at least the industry feels to me that it's catering towards that. Ooh, people who are earning $100,000 a month, whatever, you know, lots of money. (laughs) And let's just continue because that's so lucrative. But it's like, you know what? You know the power of podcasting can do to reach years that don't have that? What about the person who's making $25,000 a year? That person is the one that really needs to be listening to this. That person that has no access to healthcare. That person who feels alone. That person who is dealing with addiction. That person that needs to hear a voice like theirs. And if we can get access to those people who are at this moment underrepresented, podcasting can grow in an insane way that is going to be serving our entire society because people are going to be exposed to different voices speaking in this way. And that's not being addressed. You know, access is not being addressed. Maybe there's some people that don't have as fast Wi Fi. We all assume that everybody has access to these things. We all assume that you have an unlimited data plan. We assume that you have an iPhone. Right. You know, and what's interesting is that Android actually rules the market. They're at 81%. 81% of the world owns an Android. But up to now, 70%, of, well, let's even narrow it down. 65% of all downloads right now in podcasting are coming from your iOS devices. So that shows you that there is a huge gap in reach. Most Android devices are less money, right? They're a little bit more accessible for most. So that plays into socioeconomic status. So there's like all of these different things that I feel aren't being addressed. And also people who I'm just talking about, you know, thinking about reaching the young people, but also the older Americans or the elderly of the world. Those wonderful storytellers that have so much to say that nobody's hearing from right now can get behind a microphone and talk. That's what I'm saying. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be to introduce, you know, places where people go to retiree homes or hospices to listening to podcasts, to have listening stations for them there where they can pick and be and tap into all of this other content, things that will remind them of where they came from. Another way to tune into something rather than sitting in front of a TV watching HSN. Yes. What an you know? amazing idea. I, I mean, my sister actually runs a retirement home and you're giving me a great idea to reach out. Yes. And the same thing with libraries. If libraries got together with being able to create listening stations for podcasts in for their kids, for their little children section, for their teen section, and to have something available for all librarians. Could you imagine what that could do for podcasting, period? Right. And 
It's just that those things are not being addressed. Nobody's looking into the infrastructure of society and being able to serve these people. You know, there's so many people who go to the library just because there's free Wi-Fi or there's a computer that they can use. So and, I'll see. I'm, yes. Sorry. I'm getting all excited. <laughs> see, I can't shut up. <laughs> I want to just acknowledge the fire and passion in you. Okay. This. It's so evident. And, you know, as we get to this part of the conversation where I invite you to give me a challenge, I'm wondering as somebody that is, you know, starting out and wants to build an audience and um, I'm committed to bringing in different voices and having it be available and accessible to moms, regardless of their income level. And what would your challenge or offering be to me that you'd like to see me focus on related to all of this that you just shared? I think that it's time for you to step outside of your comfort zone of the computer part of things. And I challenge you to take a step into a library, take some, you know, if you have Mother's Quest stuff, if you have gear, like, you know, just like cards or something that you've written up that, you know, a little pamphlet or something like that. And to go inside the library and check out and go talk to the librarian and see if they would be up for putting your cards out mm. for people to listen to or to put them out there. You know, maybe that there's like mother's groups, even homeschooling co-ops that might be going around the area. They might be up to listening to some of this stuff. To be able to have a conversation with somebody that may or may not know about podcasting and share about the mission of Mother's Quest one-on-one -on -one with another person. You could do live that Live and in person. Live and in person. <laughs> and because of the skills that you will build to be able to say this, because we've gotten so complacent in being able to write the copy. So, you know, your latest episode that you had with Elizabeth was amazing. It's incredibly empowerful. And I know that you were very excited by that. I saw your posts. Mm. I saw what you wrote. Can you now embody that and take it out and say to somebody else, my God, I just talked to this woman. Her name is Elizabeth. And this is what she talked about. I think it'll be really impactful. You want to check it out? Drop it in the library. Because it'll help not only you connect with the librarians, because they want this, they want it, but also for you to be able to articulate how incredible your work is. Not from a place of like, hey, I have a great podcast, but oh my God, this can serve so many women that come in here with their kids that are overwhelmed, they're two or three year olds running around screaming. <laughs> <laughs> they can put your podcast in their ears while they're in the library. Yeah, what a brilliant thing about going to where people have access, where people are and yeah. try to bridge the gap. Because I guarantee you that the woman who you get from that interaction that does start to listen to your podcast is going to have more impact on your podcast growth versus another download. Because how do you quantify it though, Julie? What if this woman, you know, she's like, the librarian totally falls in love with your podcast. She starts to tell every single person that comes in, starts to hand out your stuff, tells them about Mother's Quest. You guys, you have to listen to this. But so she's totally talking you up, right? That's insane. That's amazing. She gets you like 10 listeners, like real live people. Right. But then maybe those people come into your Mother's Quest podcast and they decide, oh my God, I love Julie and I download your entire back catalog. How many downloads would that be? I mean, I'm just don't ask I'm just, me to do the math. I know, just say like <laughs> ten times, like ten times your latest episode, whatever episode right, this would right. be, right? Ten times, but this episode that is probably going to manifest as more downloads than the actual amount of humans that are listening. But the impact that you're having on the humans is a lot more important than the amount of downloads that you're getting. Yeah. So if we can start to shift that and quantify it from that perspective how you're shifting your local ecosystem. Mm. That is so much bigger than the download. And what would you say, Elsie, for others who are listening who maybe don't have a podcast, what would be the way to take the same challenge or principle if they want to say yes to it, to whatever they're doing in their life? I think that they can take, you know, part of it is being able to share 
what they love. And I think that we will start from there because I think that's a safer place. I gave you that challenge for you because you, Julie, are adept and you take on challenge as well. <laughs> but for some of us who are just starting, one of the best things that you can do is to get very good at being able to praise specifically something that you love. Mm -hmm. Meaning, even if it's as simple as your favorite TV show or a novel you just read or a song lyrics that's really hit you, not to put it on Facebook, uh -huh. <laughs> but to go to another human and tell them about it and affirm specifically, not say, this is the coolest song I've ever heard, but to really go deep into that because of this and this and this and this. That's the first step because that's the step that's going to give you the skills to be able to praise the good. We need to know how to do that. We need to affirm because we get so good at being critical, so good at being negative. How can we affirm the things that we love? And then they expand. Then we can get to the language that matches up with us. Then it could be, okay, I'm able to then eloquently share a mother's quest because this is what the impact that Julie's had in my life. Now, how can I share that same sort of excitement with somebody about my work, about the thing that drives me, about the excitement that I feel when I'm working on X? In the simple way that you could, maybe you're doing something in an Etsy shop and you've created cute little bags or something, or you're really trying to shift an entire part of the culture and you're creating something like, you know, those thanks panties that have the built-in tampon inside, mm -hmm. you know, or not tampon, but pad inside. That's like shifting an entire way that we've been dealing with our menstrual cycles, right? That's huge. Right. But you have to really know why that's important. You know, I mean... I've seen their CEO speak before, and the way that she spoke about it was not about the underwear. Mm. She was thinking about the sacredness of what it is to have this and the way that society has completely just not even dealt or tried to disrupt that part of, you know, selling things. It's just always been a pad. It's just a pad, and it'll always be a pad or a tampon. Mm. The end. No further communication involved. And then she's like, uh, no, let's talk about this. Let's change that conversation. And she's totally doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I know the title of this episode, oh. <laughs> which is Change the Conversation. Yes. Which brings me to my opportunity to share some of the threads of wisdom that I've been hearing weave through all that we've talked about and just to acknowledge and thank you for this time with you. I'm so thrilled to have had this conversation with somebody that you, who I really admire and I'm so grateful for. And, you know, in just before I'll be able to see you live and in person speaking. Oh my goodness. That's getting right. out from behind the computer at podcast movement, which is coming up in a few weeks. So here's what I'm taking away. And then I'd love to hear what is surfacing for you. I'm really taking in this commitment to voice, to really speaking up and elevating dialogue. Also to do that though about the things that really matter. So looking beyond numbers or the traditional metrics out there, a masculine way of valuing ourselves and the work we do and really getting clear about what's underneath it all, what matters the most. And then the third thing would be this commitment to access and to really beginning to shift the way that our culture works and particularly bringing, you know, this power and potential of podcasting to so many more people. And I accept your challenge. <laughs> like I'll be making a visit to the library. More than that. And you have to take a picture. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll be taking a picture of me talking to the librarian. <laughs> And, you know, also, I think this episode is going to come out right around the time of podcast movement. So I'm going to be bringing cards oh, um, yes. and really connecting with other podcasters there and spreading the word about Mother's Quest and the importance of having this reach women who are mothers who are often isolated or who have sidelined their own dreams. So I commit to the act of visiting the library, but even bigger than that, the overall point of getting out of my comfort zone and really speaking about what I love and care about with 
others. Thank Yay. you. That's so great. What are you taking? What's surfacing for you as some new reflections or anything you've had mirrored back to you now from this conversation? I think one of the things that was really impactful were your questions, you know, because they made me have to get very specific in drawing parallels or drawing, I think, the connections between what I've carried for so long in terms of my behavior Mm. and the ability to have to give voice to some of that right now and to own up, again, in a public way, the way that we tend to hide behind digital, the way that we tend to excel maybe at one part and people only see that one part, but they don't see the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that It's also driven home my commitment to want that to not be the case anymore because our society in the cyberspace is moving to a way that we're going to be making decisions purely based on digital connections and what we see. May we, I think this is a little bit of a prayer or, you know, an evocation, if you want, of some kind. May we allow ourselves to do the work, really, our internal work, our human work so that we can show up with our people, like in real life. I feel that's still a challenge for me. You know, I can't say I was allowed a pass, but society is construed in such a way that some of us get passes a lot of the time. And I was one of those people. I got a pass because I tend to excel on some parts of my life. And that includes the way that I behave and the way that I look. And that was a pass. And we tend to give people passes for things that they shouldn't get it for. And I'm one of those. I should have been called on my stuff a whole lot before I had kids. Uh (laughs) A whole lot before. And so I'm calling myself out. And I hope that may we choose to do the work with ourselves and, you know, and grow up. Mm. Powerful note to end on. Thank you, Elsie. I will see you soon. I look forward to sharing this conversation with my community and beyond. Yay! Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, head over to mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, and help us spread the word. I want to end with some words to light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.